Right, we'll start in one minute, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. Okay, well, uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, second part of our joint uh, Dynamic Coalition on Internet of Things and Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values. Uh, it's a long morning moving into the afternoon afterwards. Uh, the first part was pretty exciting. We'll try and make the second part as uh, exciting as the first one. I see some new faces around the room, and some people have had to also move to other sessions as well. And um, I guess we can, uh, well, we've got 90 minutes here uh, for this session. Um, I'm going to hand the floor to Martin Bottomen in a moment to uh, take us through what was discussed, or perhaps Shane, I'm not sure, Shane Tews or whoever wants to proceed forward. My name is Olivier Calpin Leblanc. I'm the uh, chair of the Dan Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values, uh, also wearing a few other hats, uh, uh, UK chapter of the Internet Society and uh, also part of the European <coughs> at-large organization in ICANN. Um, we have a number of new panelists uh, with us, uh, and of course this is really meant to be a session with a lot of interaction and dialogue with everyone, so we'll probably keep interventions to a minimum and then open the floor and get, get some, some movement uh, going. Um, so I just wanted to recognize our, uh, the people that have come into the room, uh, that when, uh, some of whom were not in the first session, uh, with uh, Alejandro Pizanti sitting next to me, um, who will speak to us uh, about the uh, summary of the 6F framework proposal that he has uh, put together. Uh, Jimson Olofuye, whom uh, you've seen already in the first part. Welcome, Jimson. Uh, Marilyn Cade, unfortunately, couldn't make it uh, for a, a specific reason. She sent her apologies, but she might be listening remotely. So if you're uh, listening and watching Marilyn, um, see you very soon. And uh, please, uh, if, if you can, um, uh, put some, some comments in the chat. That would be uh, really helpful. We'll be happy to read it to the record. Uh, Matthew Shears uh, is uh, with us uh, as well. Um, Shiva Subramanian Mutusami will be joining us remotely from India, and uh, he's, he'll have a little part explaining to us the core internet values. Uh, and uh, Thomas Rickert is uh, still with us over at the end of the table. Welcome again, Thomas. And uh, finally, last but not least, Vin Cerf has uh, joined us, um, and uh, so we look forward to your contributions. So I think that uh, we can uh, quickly then uh, look at the part one the last 90 minutes before the break, before everyone had the time to discuss further. Uh, Martin, would you like to take the floor, please? Yes, thank you for that, Olivier. Um, the combining of the core internet values with the IoT session is in a way a sign of increasing maturity that these things matter how we, we approach it. And in many ways, it's comparable to internet, how we deal with internet of things and Internet of Things has specific uh, characteristics. The first part of this session, we focused on security because if we don't secure, if we don't create an environment in which we can rely on what these things do and don't do, whatever we think uh, how we should deal with it will not be enforceable. And potentially, uh, the IoT may become a bigger danger than a blessing. And that's a big thing because it's a blessing we need. We need IoT devices to 
manage our environments to assist us in ways that otherwise would not be affordable or possible. So in the, in the security dis discussion, there was uh, some talks about what level of security is needed. And a very strong takeaway was also that in this, we don't talk about the blanket IoT. It matters what you talk about. And we need to look into cl classifications when we dive deeper to, the, to, to become more concrete on security issues. It does matter whether IoT devices are passive or active. It does matter in what function they are used. Examples given were an aeroplane, which is in a way uh, a big uh, combination of a lot of IoT devices, plus wings and chairs, and, and cars, etc. cetera. Uh, but other advantage, examples were also the tags that are used to track food on the other side, which obviously don't have a lot of uh, high uh, costs with it, because that would add to the cost of the food, and at the same time, uh, the vulnerability of such passive devices is also different. So that's one thing. Uh, security key, because whatever we build, we become dependable on, and if it's not secure, uh, that leads to dangers. Second, classification, very important. We need to become more concrete on that part. Uh, one suggestion given to enforce more secure devices or to encourage more uh, secure devices was that, uh, for instance, government can contribute not so much by telling how it needs to be or try to regulation on technology level, but by their procurement policies, because governments are big purchasers in this, and in that way they can influence the market in a positive direction. The very last remark uh, that came in on the very uh, makes us realize again how much this also relates, and there's so much in place in the IGF. It's relevant also that we make sure they're available and usable and affordable for those countries in the global south that need it for crop management, for dealing with extreme weather, and for other uh, applications that uh, would be so much served by this. And for that, we cannot just send devices south, we also need to work uh, in such a way that capacity building takes place that people who live in specific regions are the best ones to know how to use those tools. So uh, with that, I think I covered most of it. Did I forget anything? Uh, anybody else? That oh, accessibility. Um? The only thing I would add is the comments about accessibility and the importance about thinking about accessibility in the design process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shane. And Shane will be, is from now on, the chair of the Dynamic Coalition of IoT. Thank you, Martin. And congratulations to you, Shane, for taking over this important task. So we look forward to working together with you. And goodbye, Martin. Um, <laughs> was that blunt enough? OK, um, well. Anyway, you've got new responsibilities now, so uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll see you still in, uh, in, in, in the room uh, every now and then. Right, so um, thank you. Uh, I, th I guess we can now plow forward then with, with, with this second part. I guess w one of the points that we asked in the first, uh, at the end of the first part was with regards to regulation. Do we require hardcore regulation? And, and of course, making that distinction between the different types of IoT devices, where you might have automotive IoT devices, industrial IoT devices, and consumer IoT devices, uh, some are already regulated. The automotive uh, industry is extremely regulated due to the safety concerns of moving vehicles that could cause a great deal of damage. Uh, whilst others, such as the consumer IoT devices, are still pretty much an open book. Um, one of the questions being, of course, do we want hardcore regulation or should we have some kind of an ethical framework that uh, organizations, companies, consumers, uh, etc., uh, subscribe to as in a good practice uh, for IoT uh, security and IoT devices. But of course, we're also looking at the core internet values, and I'm, I'm going to hand the floor over to uh, Shiva Subramanian Mutasami to give you a little bit of a background uh, on what the core internet values are. I know that some organizations call them the internet invariants, the uh, technical values on which the internet uh, was built. Um, I, Shiva is in India, so I'm hoping that he can, uh, can we unmute him and see if we can have him come over the, uh, the 
the conference reach. I hope this is working. Can you hear me, Olivier? A long time ago, I think we're, we're not in full duplex, we're in simplex in, in that um, you have to speak and then we'll speak and then we'll hand the floor over to you. Anyway, we have your slides that are coming up on the screen, uh, hopefully, and uh, we can then uh, hand the floor over to you. And if you need to uh, go to the next slide, please ask explicitly then to go to the next slide. So uh, there we go, Dynamic Coalition. Over to you, Shiva Subramanian. Uh, can you hear me, Olivier? Yes, acknowledge, continue, proceed. Okay, uh, uh, I'm Siva Subramaniam from India. Olivier has introduced me and uh, I'll intervene by audio. Uh, we have uh, been doing this uh, work on core internet values. The coalition, the leaders in the room, they've been doing the work on core internet values uh, since 2009. And we've defined and articulated uh, certain core internet values. Uh, please go to the slide that says core internet values. Uh, we've art articulated uh, it as follows. Internet is global, open, free, interoperable. The internet is user-centric and end-to-end, -end, robust and reliable, and works as an ecosystem for permissionless innovation. It has a distributed architecture that requires an unique approach to its governance. Uh, these are architectural values, but uh, what we are talking about is not just architectural values, but uh, architectural values that reflect as global values. Uh, internet values are not merely technical values. The technical values percolate down as universal values. Because the un underlying architectural values result in larger social benefits, and these reflect as global values. For instance, the architectural value of interoperability, openness, result in the social benefit of a global network of networks that connects the people globally, connects people across geographies and cultures. So these va values uh, result in one internet, which makes one world. These values do not change. Uh, sorry, uh, the next uh, next slide, uh, the slide after next slide, uh, the slide that says values do not change. These these are core internet values. These values do not change. These values are not swept away in an occasional flood, nor dispersed across languages and cultures. These are inherent, permanent, and at the foundation. There are some uh, contrary views to that, but uh, that's debatable. But uh, the point is that. Uh, we can look at values as inherent and unchanging because uh, the internet is what it is because of these values and the internet happens to be unfathomably benevolent to the whole world despite evolutionary challenges uh, some certain problems that arise certain problems that alarm us despite all that the internet is very useful and invaluable and uh, when we talk about internet values, uh, inherent values, uh, again, uh, those inevitable security measures that seem, seem to deviate from the core internet values, we have to consider them as transitory, temporary, uh, necessary measures for the time. And uh, the last slide, uh, to preserve and perpetuate these values and to benefit from them, we also need to call for governance values that need to be in tune with internet values. Internet governance is global, uh, need not be looked at uh, a central governance model. It's global without being central. It's globally distributed, yet it's harmonious. It's coordinated. We are not talking about control. So it's not a controlled government. Uh, it's not a governance process of control. And uh, necessary measures occasionally uh, that are uh, needed globally, regionally, or nationally could uh, often could be taken uh, by consultation in the multi-stakeholder process, either formally or informally. That's uh, just about what I want to say. Thank you, and thank you very much. 
Thank you very much for this, uh, uh, Shiva. Actually, just go, go back to the, ne to, to the previous slide because we didn't have this displayed when you, you spoke about them, so I, I just want to sort of lead them for a few minutes on there. Um, so thank you for your intervention, and uh, now we're going to go through our various uh, uh, panelists, and of course, the, the first question, which is in your agenda. Um, well, first thing I needed to mention was that there are some papers about core internet values that are in the agenda. It's been updated, um, so you can read some of the previous discussions in, in previous years. But today's discussion really is about the ethical, potentially ethical considerations um, and, and how are they important for development, deployment and use of IoT. Um, and in order to ensure that we're creating sustainable uh, solutions uh, with IoT. If we're going to have legislation, does it break this whole permissionless innovation uh, side to things? Is, is the IoT the internet? I've heard some that say that it isn't, that they're, they're two very different things. Um, some are saying, well, you know, IoT is just sensors and a gateway and it's, uh, it's completely out of it, or they could just be in, in uh, private networks and so on. So lots of uh, potential topics here. Uh, let's um, start then uh, and get, get some, some views from Jensen. Uh, I'm going to go through this alphabetically um, as, as listed in first name basis. And so that leaves a V for Vint at the end. Um, and so Jensen, uh, Olaf Foyer, um, what, what are your views on that? And you've been, of course, reflecting on, on the first part of this discussion that you've taken part in as well. Thank you very much, uh, Olivier. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Jimson Olufoye. Well, we've uh, discussed in the first part, and it was quite interesting. And the linkage is... Uh, it's also very inter interesting. Well, talking about um, the internet core value, uh, especially with regard to uh, governance, uh, data governance, and uh, reflecting on the short presentation uh, by Siva, well, he says we should take a cue from the, the internet layer itself, okay? The internet layer, of course, uh, technically we have the link uh, layer, we have the network, uh, the transport, and uh, of course the presentation. And they work harmoniously, okay, from one layer to the other, so there is a perfect handshake. And as he said, uh, it has worked, this core value has worked uh, in every culture. Uh, it has permitted any society, and it has helped to create content that benefited uh, society by and large, and prospered economies you know, globally. And uh, it, this is the model. It's global, it's open, interoperable, transparent, uh, perfect harmony. So why can't we have that when it comes to uh, the maybe the data governance itself, because that is why we are here. Internet governance. Uh, how do we address those issues regard to security? We uh, regard to intellectual property. How do we we have resolved some part of it, like critical internet uh, resources, managing the critical internet resources, like. Uh, Called looking at uh, IP4, IP6, DNX. So that's been resolved with ICANN, okay? Which I think is one of the examples of uh, enhanced cooperation as it is. Because today we have the government there, we have the private sector, civil society, academia, uh, we have all stakeholders, technical people, uh, working well. We, if you look at it from uh, a far distance, you can say, well, they are working harmoniously in a way, yes, because we are discussing within that uh, framework. So now moving to managing the, the content, or we have been speaking earlier about how do we ensure that IoT serve us? So what are the, how do we categorize them? And uh, what level of uh, accountability you know, should they have? embedded you know, within them. So there have been discussions, even at the United Nations as we know, because all this came from WISIS. 
you know, from the WISIS 2005, yes, we talk about uh, Internet Governance Forum, we talk about enhanced cooperation. Uh, but the core requirement for enhanced cooperation, as I said, has been satisfied from my perspective by ICANN. You know, what the uh, finalization of the oversight function of the uh, the, the, the IANA in 2016, October 1st, you know, by the US, so which has been handed over to the global community. So that is resolved. Excellent. So the next level is uh, how do we resolve other issues? At different level, maybe at the national level, uh, we have some things happening. For example, in Nigeria, we have the data protection regulation now. Uh, that came to be in April this year uh, to at least guide in terms of governance of uh, data of Nigerian citizens. At the regional level, AU has come up with uh, the AU Convention on the Data Protection and Cyber Security. Of course, even at the EU, we know about the popular GDPR. So um, in terms of compatibility, you know, that could create issues. So we need to uh, ensure that innovation is not striving. We need to ensure that uh, wealth is continuously created. So, and to do this, we need to have generally acceptable framework, okay? Because if you look at the Kenyan uh, data protection regulation, it, it has uh, imprisonment, prison terms of five years, uh, 5,000 shillings. Well, five million shillings fine, or five million shillings fine. In Nigeria, there is no uh, thing like uh, penalty, maybe uh, imprisonment penalty, but there is a fine, maybe about $30,000. But compared to GDPR, which is 5% of growth, which is huge, okay? So we need to have an, a framework that harmonizes all this, and that's why uh, the issue of uh, resolving, uh, having a general standard, comes to play. And if I may, uh, the high level panel made, a, one of, made several recommendations. One of the recommendations talk about a multi-stakeholder working group whereby we can bring in all these important uh, principles and then we all accept it. But how can we accept it if we don't have an instrument? And uh, an instrument I have seen that it would be relevant is still the uh, the CSTD, okay, the, that is the United Nations Commission for Science and Technology for Development, you know. If we have this working group under the CSTD, then it will be easy for the, all the resolution, because we have some form of uh, consensus now, so to speak, about these principles. These principles can then be passed to the ECOSOC, that is Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, and then that can then move into the uh, General Assembly and accepted, you know, by everybody. So I, will need, I think we need to get to that point so that when they get to the GA, accepted by all, it's a form of a treaty, and it will be binding in, on, in a way upon the manufacturers of devices, it will be mandatory, binding, you know, on associations and what have you. Yes, we can say we could do self-governance, but that is not the ultimate. Because moving ahead, the risk ahead requires that we should coordinate it perfectly. It should be, it doesn't mean that we should cancel national activity, regional activity, but at least at the global level, it should maintain that same handshake, a high level of cooperation. So uh, in short, uh, there is need to look at how we resolve this at the global level and through the CSTD. The CSTD is a, it's an existing framework because part of the mandate of CSTD is to discuss public policy and internet governance policy, public policy. The framework is already there and the private sector is there. The, at least in the working group will be there. At least the last one we did, phase one and phase two, all stakeholders were represented and we, we, we were all, we listened to ourselves, very harmonious. And I think it's, an, it's a framework, an instrument that we should uh, use to advance uh, the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this, uh, Jimson. That's quite a, a concrete proposal. Next is uh, Matthew Schertz. Matthew. Thanks, Olivier. Um, so I'm going to, to, to bring it 
back a little to the discussion we had earlier on. Um, I think what was so interesting about these two parts to this, and it's very, it makes a, a lot of sense that they have been um, um, brought together. I mean, that there are some characteristics about IoT, I think, that can give us some indicators as to whether or not they, the devices or the networks that they comprise actually do pose ethical dilemmas and, and possibly undermine core values. And there are three things, I think, that are quite pertinent. Um, there's no doubt that when the networks are um, deployed, that they will be relatively ubiquitous across public and private spaces. They will be sensing and communicating, and they are networked, and they will contribute to the accumulation of data which will be used for diverse purposes. And they'll be low cost, they are low cost, and they are also discrete in their form factor which can be adapted to local environments. And the challenge here is not so much whether or not the devices in and of themselves break or contradict any of the, the core values, but it's really about how they were used. And it's in their use that they could well pose ethical dilemmas and, um, and could be in con contradiction to the core values. The, at the same time, I'm, I think we've been here before with these discussions. Um, we, we have these same kind of discussions every time we have a new technology. We, we wonder about the ethical dimensions. We wonder about how they will impact human rights. We've had it with 3G, 4G. Now we're probably having the same thing with 5G as well. So, so the, what's different here is the potential of the scale of the damage to persons and systems um, if the, uh, these networks are not managed in particular ways. So, so we, we know that, I think we know what the challenges are, um, and we know we have a collective responsibility to address them before these devices flood the markets and um, the consequences of their deployment uh, make us perpetually on the back foot when it comes to managing them. Um, some of the things I think that we, you know, that we need to consider, and, and again, this might obviate the need for addressing, or it's a manner in which we can address some of the ethical challenges, is, is much of this is gonna be about changing behaviors. We're, we're, it may be indeed unrealistic, but at some point we're going to have to think about how we um, uh, ask more of the individual user um, to take responsibility for their network and for understanding that their network of IoT devices in their home is a part of a greater whole. It's also gonna take a change of behaviors among manufacturers to implement levels of security and security by design, for example, and agreeing what are the minimum security requirements before devices can be put on the market. Um, but there's no easy way forward here in this multi-dimensional, multi-layered challenge, but it's one we're gonna to have to step up to. But I think that coming back, it's really the deployment of these devices that's gonna challenge us the most. Um, you know, when you put devices on the market, they may well be safe and they may well uh, meet certain minimum security standards, but it's the purposes to which those networks and those devices when put on the network, that, that the purposes they're put to, which will really determine what kind of ethical challenges we're going to have to face going forward. So I guess that was the idea, just to leave you with, kind of tie this into what we talked about this morning and leave you with the thought that we have to consider um, not just whether or not devices are secure when they're put on the network, but also how do we prevent the uses that they may be put to, which could really challenge us from an ethical and also from a, a core internetworking perspective. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Matthew. Um, I've seen a number of people wanting to, to comment on this. We'll, have the, we'll open the floor for discussion afterwards. I, I'd like to first try and go through the different, uh, different panelists uh, we, we have. So, so far, we've got a proposal that the CSTD could be a good location for these discussions and for providing a framework. We've got uh, a point about the uh, end user requiring uh, to, to be a bit more astute in how they use their devices and, and to learn a bit more about them. Let's hear from... Uh, uh, from uh, um, um, Thomas Rickard, uh, who who can provide us, but maybe another point, uh, or maybe the same. Thanks very much, Olivier. This is Thomas Rickard, Eco Internet Industry Association, for the record. And um, I, I think the um, one point that I'd like to add to the discussion is that in, in Germany, Eco has recently published um, a booklet on ethics in, in digitalization and. Uh, the, there was a survey done, um, and it was asked who in the eye of the people that, that were asked is uh, mainly responsible for making sure that there are ethical rules being observed uh, when it comes to digitalization. 
And interestingly, 39% uh, of the respondents said that it's up to the political arena. Um, and I think that's sort of striking because um, other than what Matthew said earlier, it will be potentially challenging to, to get users um, take more responsibility because if they ask for the legislators to, to step in, obviously they want to push responsibility elsewhere. Um, um, little comfort is, is given by the fact that 31% said that um, um, all stakeholders uh, have a shared responsibility to make this work, and that would include uh, um, the, the companies and uh, uh, science and, and civil society. But still, I think we have quite some work to do to raise awareness for you know, actually making everybody uh, take their, their share of responsibility. Um, and also, I think that what, um, it's, a, it's a sort of comforting trend that we see um, uh, legislation evolving all around the globe that is um, similar or comparable to, uh, to GDPR, which I think embeds some of the principles that we, uh, that we need to have in place when it comes to ethical software development, like, you know, security by design, privacy by design, certain rights for users to exercise. Uh, and so I think it needs to be a, a combination of legislative efforts uh, in combination with uh, raising user awareness uh, to make sure that they use uh, devices in a, uh, and services in a responsible manner. Thank you for this, uh, Thomas. Um, I mean, there's already a lot that uh, end users need to learn about. We've all heard in many of the other sessions the, uh, the issues of hate speech, privacy, uh, fake news. Uh, the, 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 there seems to be a, uh, maybe a course that everyone has to follow when they, after they're born as to how, to how to navigate the virtual world these days, um, in addition to how to navigate the real world. Well, uh, for someone who knows a bit about the uh, virtual Olivia, world... I'm, I'm sorry, I, yeah, um, now that you say that, maybe one point that I should add from the, from the survey, and um, sorry for not, not um, adding that earlier. The users said that only 6.5% you know, of the users said that it's the, the, the companies that are offering the services that should be responsible for ethical standards. So, and I guess that's quite telling because obviously the users don't trust the companies to be capable of, of, uh, uh, of offering a certain level of comfort. Thank you, Thomas. For, for someone then who knows a little bit about the virtual world and maybe a lot about companies, let's uh, have Vincef. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to make several observations. I want to begin with some that uh, are uh, perhaps a bit broader than our focus discussion. The first one is an observation about users. Some of us have been thinking that an internet driver's license might be a very useful concept. Not that we really issue certification, but the idea is that people should take classes in how to use the internet and be aware of the hazards uh, that, uh, that might confront them. So that's one kind of interesting idea. The second thing is that the phrase permissionless innovation, something I uh, make use of frequently, uh, has uh, come under fire recently. And it occurs to me that permissionless innovation does not mean uh, irresponsible innovation. And so I think the term responsibility, accountability, other things like that are becoming uh, more common in our vocabulary as we talk about the internet and the uses to which it is put. Uh, and so I think we should hang on to that notion of responsibility and accountability. Uh, with regard to uh, IoT devices in particular, uh, I had uh, one, two, three, six different desirable properties of uh, IoT devices, some of which have already been mentioned, uh, but uh, for the record, reliability is very important. Why would you want a device that only worked 85% of the time? Uh, second, security, and, and here I really want to refer to integrity of the updates to software, which we know will be needed, either to add functionality or to fix bugs. And that means knowing where did the update come from, knowing that the update has integrity, digital signatures will be helpful there. Uh, security also means defense against attempts to attack, to control, to otherwise abuse uh, the IoT device. Uh, and finally, access control. Uh, so that the device takes command and delivers data only to authorized parties. So it's pretty clear that that functionality should be built into the IoT devices and they should be evaluated uh, against those criteria. 
safety, for sure, no one wants an IoT device that is patently unsafe, whether it's in your office, the car, or uh, at home, or something you're carrying around on your person. Accessibility has come up, come up more than once, and I am a huge fan of that. You know I'm wearing a headset because I'm hearing impaired, but other people have other uh, disabilities that require accommodation, and it's a hard problem. Uh, the, the design of accessible systems is actually quite uh, difficult. Affordability is clear. If, if we uh, want everyone to benefit from these devices, they have to be affordable in the context in which they are acquired and used. And finally, I want to use the word sustainability here, which is a popular phrase around the United Nations, but in this case, what I mean to say is that if for the lifetime of that device, that it needs to be sustained. That means that the maker of the device needs to make some commitments about how long that device will be maintained, the software uh, kept up to date. Uh, the user should have some expectation and the makers should uh, be uh, transparent about their intent with regard to maintaining the device. So those are, are the kind of desirable properties that, uh, that I see. Uh, the, uh, two other points uh, and then I'll stop. Um, one of them has to do with this notion of shared responsibility that uh, Thomas uh, brought up. I am a great subscriber to this notion that there is plenty of responsibility to be spread around in the use of internet-based devices and from users to manufacturers to legislators. <laughs> the one thing I will say is that the legislators, after they pass laws, uh, leave a lot on the table because somehow those laws have to be enforced, otherwise they are not useful. So there is some uh, issue there to make sure that laws are implementable. And finally, I wanted to draw, uh, Matthew made a, an interesting point uh, about the purposes to which the devices are put. And there is an analogy here uh, to content showing up, for example, in, in social media. It is the content that creates so much of the turmoil and debate that we've experienced in the past decade or so. And the purposes are a parallel notion. What did you, how did you use or how did you abuse uh, the IoT devices? So, uh, so, Mr. Chairman, those are some of the thoughts that come immediately to my mind, uh, and I think they are consistent with the uh, things that we've heard earlier. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vint. You, you mentioned one point which uh, had been touched on in the uh, first uh, part of this double session uh, regarding the sustainability of the device, uh, with an example being a refrigerator or, or, or goods that have a long lifespan uh, but yet might need to be constantly updated and whether they would be usable without the IoT component part. Uh, if I could, uh, thank you for bringing that up. The, uh, the more immediate, that's a long-term consideration. Uh, and it, if it turns out that if, uh, if, if it's not maintained, uh, can you still make use of it? There is a related issue, uh, and that is uh, autonomy, and I'm going to add that to my list here. Uh, and here I'm, I'm not thinking of, uh, you know, the uh, autonomous uh, evil refrigerator which takes over the house and does other bad things. I'm thinking here about the fact that these devices should work even if the internet access is gone. Uh, no, we hope not necessarily gone forever, but, uh, but it, you, you want your house to continue to run even if the internet connection happens to break. And if you don't design it that way, uh, there's quite a bit of damage that can be done to everybody's daily lives just by interfering with internet access. Okay, thank you. I think we can open the floor now, and uh, Khaled Fatal is the first person in the queue, and um, then, no, uh, yep, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Olivier. Um, uh, Khaled Fatal here. I'm uh, the chairman of the MLI group. Um, before we started the session, Vint and I were having a chat, and it was totally separate from the topic here, and we were discussing how important it is to have critical thinking, uh, especially with the young people, so that they're able to challenge. And so, I'm not running for office. I'm not uh, uh, seeking any, uh, any self-glory. So allow me to actually challenge and, and try to, imp to, to walk the walk and talk the talk here. Because some of the things that we're trying to do, and I, I'm going to 
bring in some of the pieces of what has been discussed so far. But at your opening remark, uh, Olivier, as chairman of the session, you wa you, the, we wanted to address what do we do with IoT? Do we legislate or do we just leave it open? What do we do? So, and I was finding it challenging to understand where we were going with that problem to solve by starting with what is known as core values. So, are the core values that we heard at the beginning axioms? You technologists could answer me. Are they axioms or are they aspirations? So here is a philosophical thinking, ladies and gentlemen. If we don't do that, guess what? We're becoming less and less relevant. So if you tell me that there are axioms, I will tell you they're not axioms because it's uh, one vision does not mean everybody shares that same vision. And it certainly is not one net. It's a, a network of networks. So if you want to call it a marketing exercise, I, you know, happy to accept it as a market exercise. Secondly, um, one world, yes, it is one world. So if you tell me this is aspirational, I'm happy to go by that, and then I will say, how do we make this aspiration a reality? Then you've got me as a buy-in. But if you tell me it's an axiom, I'm going to challenge you, and I will defeat you in the debate. That's one. Secondly, many of you who have been talking about IOTs may know this fact, because I repeat this fact at every private briefing we do, we do to boards and governments and Vint will probably confirm it as well. On average, every quarter, more than a billion IoT devices are entering the internet with little attention to patching or security. Now, for those of you who are adhering to a philosophical, philosophical position, position of laissez-faire, no government intervention, no legislation, wake up, wake up and smell the coffee because to propose to educate the citizen and even giving him a driver's license on the internet, guess what? Um, the world will get devastated before that plan could work. So something has to happen before that. So what is that? So either we educate everybody, and all of a sudden now every citizen is so informed, and they know exactly how to buy this, this doll that talks to them and make sure that its, it's IoT device is, is not snooping on them, or we have to find something else. In my book, there's, we are finding it inescapable that certain governments will legislate. So when we don't mention it, we sound like we are as if, no, no, legislation bled. We all know legislation has unintended consequences. But then I weigh the risks versus the, the reward. With a billion devices entering every quarter with very little attention to, to, to security and patching, and the threat to society, and waiting to educate the citizen who today has, has, has never had so much infor information at their fingertips ever in the history of civilization, yet they've never been so misinformed, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and you want to tell me, you want to go and educate them? I think you better find another job. So in conclusion, part of the points that I think Vent raised, and I want to add on that because I think it's very relevant. When we talk about shared responsibility, we need to add the word, just like 10 years ago, I used to challenge those at ICANN that it's not about serving the public interest, it's serving the global public interest. And many of them used to raise an eyebrow at me. Now they're all using it like it's the latest song by, uh, I don't know who the latest uh, pop singer. So shared responsibility need to have another term added to it. It's proportional shared responsibility, ladies and gentlemen. So. The so citizen, yes, the citizen needs to be better engaged and better informed. And this, within this forum, within the IGF, I think we are in the perfect place to try and create better awareness. But better awareness does not mean that they're aware enough. But proportionate means that those who are in a position of authority, who can legislate, we can help them do better legislation, so at least we can save society as well. So on that note, <coughs> Uh, don't vote for me because I'm not running for office. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Khaled. Next is Alejandro Pizanti. Uh, thank you, Olivier. I will be, I'll try to be very brief because I have also scheduled time, so I'm not replying only to two of the interventions. One of them is uh, Jimson Nulufuye. Uh, I think that uh, 
the proposal to take the governance of the Internet of Things to the CSTD uh, resonates very strongly with the idea that the world can have one single government and that the UN actually is that government, and that's just not the case. Uh, the CSTD is uniquely placed to hold some discussions that are attractive to uh, some government officials in some countries who like to go to a single place, a single uh, point of contact, but uh, it definitely doesn't exhaust the space and you have to get a lot more. I think Matthew Shears' intervention basically does away with that proposal. I mean, sweeps it not under the rug, but over the window. And to Khaled Fatal, uh, first your question, uh, whether these uh, core values that have been enunciated uh, are aspirational wishes or desires, no, sir. These are the design principles of the internet. The internet was designed in a sequential order uh, where there's still maybe a bit of uh, a question whether it's best effort or interoperability that is like the first principle you take into account. Then you have openness and so forth, and they are hierarchically ordered. Uh, those that are not design principles which, by which you stick, but which are, for example, uh, robustness or stability, these are not desires, these are design objectives. These are design goals, and that's pretty objective. And for your point on uh, proportional responsibility. For years we have been speaking uh, about uh, multi-stakeholder governance in particular and uh, the design of multi-stakeholder mechanisms. Uh, this is to do away with the idea of multi-stakeholderism. Multi-stakeholderism would be like an ideology or a religion, uh, whereas multi-stakeholder governance is a method, it's a principle you can work on. And then what you see, of course, is if you look at things like ICANN, you have a very structured system because you have decisions that are binding, that lead to contracts, that may lead to gain or loss of money, and therefore you also have to have accountability, you have to have the opportunity to redress wrong decisions, and so forth. Whereas on the other hand, you have the IGF, which is very open for discussion, based on two principles, which are again very clear, which is the principle of open discussion and the principle of non-duplication. And the principle of non-duplication tells you that whenever you find something that's, for example, uh, liable to go to CSTD, like Jameson thinks, you will take it to CSTD, and if it's not enough, you will do something else. If it's telecoms policy, you will take it to the ITU or to your local or regional spectrum agency, uh, but you can have this more open discussion, and the only rule that applies is sort of rules of civility and multi-stakeholder balance participation. So that will take you to, I mean, that problem has been solved for you mostly, and if you want to follow through to what the citizen can do, you can, you can still get it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this, Alejandro. I see a person in the room, and then we'll go for a question from a remote participant. So please go ahead and introduce yourself. Yes, you have the floor. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Jack Chen. I'm not speaking on behalf of any entity at the moment. Um, given that perfect security is realistically impossible, uh, it's realistically a matter of time and resources to break the security of any device, right? Considering that nation state level tax on infrastructure has occurred and will occur, um, for example, Stuxnet, I'll be framing this, uh, this discussion with the goal of securing IoT devices from nation state level attacks. Uh, should nations agree to not perform cyber attacks on nation's critical infrastructure um, by some, some kind of convention or not? Yeah. Yes, Vint. So it's a pretty interesting formulation. Let me take the last part first, because the Global Council on the Stability of Cyberspace proposed a norm uh, related to the last point that you made, and that norm was that we would not, we would agree that um, as normative that countries would not attack the core infrastructure of the Internet. Um, of course, a, a norm is not a guarantee, it's not a treaty, uh, it's not enforceable, but as a principle, uh, to the degree that we all believe that the internet is a constructive and, and beneficial uh, artifact, uh, then agreeing not to wreck it uh, is probably a useful thing to, uh, to try. With regard to um, nation state attacks against IoT devices, uh, they can, as you point out, be very, very uh, sophisticated. Uh, and so an absolute guarantee um, or building uh, security structures that will absolutely uh, be proof against uh, concerted attack is probably um, impossible. And even if it were possible, it might be too expensive. It might make the devices uh, unaffordable. And so the answer to this is twofold. 
The first one is do the best you can. We're back to best efforts again. And the second thing is that some of the uh, ways in which those devices are configured and uh, structured might allow multiple uh, defenses uh, to protect those devices. So it, rather than leaving the light bulb to defend itself uh, against a nation state attack, it might be embedded in a system that also has additional protections uh, beyond just that light bulb. Uh, and so architecturally speaking, we might want to build in multiple defenses uh, or defense in depth, which is a very popular uh, construct in most security designs. Uh, thanks for this. And of course, as we're, we're uh, having more and more devices that are IoT enabled, this is a, a, growing, uh, a growing concern, obviously. Um, let's, let's have the question from the person online and then we'll come over to you. Okay, this is the question of uh, Shiva Subramanian to uh, Vinturf. Uh, why do we have a class called Internet of Things unless there is an act architectural distinction on how devices connect and the inf interface on the internet? Why not talk only of an internet with no subclasses and view the internet as an internet of people who also happen to connect their devices to their own access zone? Yeah. Well, uh, that's an interesting way of uh, phrasing the question. The first observation I would make is that at least we can talk about engineering the devices. It's really hard to engineer people. Uh, so the behavior of the devices might be more in our, uh, under our control than the behavior of people. Uh, I will also point out that many of the problems we have on the internet are the consequence of the behavior of people. And figuring out how to do, deal with that is not a question of engineering. Uh, it's a question of behavioral psychology and sociology and incentives and all those other things. The reason we talk about uh, IoT, I think, is simply that it, it is the latest class of thing which has software in it that allows the device to be connected to the internet and to interact with other things that are uh, on the net. But as most of you, I hope, will appreciate, the uh, internet protocols were very carefully designed to make no distinction between uh, devices on either end. Uh, of an internet uh, exchange. And so a supercomputer on one end can talk to a light bulb on the other end, and from the protocol point of view, they are all equal uh, from, uh, in, the, in the eyes of the internet architecture. Uh, on the other hand, we all recognize that light bulbs and supercomputers have different capabilities, uh, and therefore it could be used or abused in different ways and at different scales. So um, I, I appreciate the... Um, let's say, the purity of, of looking at this without classification. I think IoT is simply a convenient label for a collection of things that are now <coughs> new on the net that weren't there before, appliances and things of that sort. Uh, thank you, Vint. Just a quick question. Is, is that ability for the light bulb to speak to the supercomputer likely to be uh, somehow less likely with uh, 5G uh, being another dimension that might break network neutrality as such. Wow, I have not heard a sentence with as many buzzwords in it as that in quite a while. I, I, I thought a long time about yeah, this one and yeah. I didn't include blockchain nor, yeah, right. uh, nor encryption. I was waiting for you to do that and cryptocurrency and, and everything else and by the way, you know, uh, I want a pony. Right? Uh, um, so the answer, I actually think the answer is unknowable. And the reason for that is that when we designed the internet, we didn't know what the things that were on it were going to need to do. And so we wanted to make sure that anything could talk to anything else. Now, many people will tell you that's a bad thing. Some things shouldn't talk to other things. But we couldn't know that when we were doing the original design. Uh, so it's very possible that a light bulb will turn out to be an important thing for a supercomputer to talk to. Uh, maybe to gather information that that light bulb has. And I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm thinking. Who knows what it has? Maybe, oh, it could turn out to be that the light bulb is keeping track of how many times it's been turned on and turned off. Uh, you know, what's the lifetime of that light bulb likely, left remaining light time, ah, lifetime, likely uh, on that device. There is something else about the device that might be failing. Uh, so that you can imagine collecting data and crunching it in the supercomputer, 
from a whole bunch of devices, partly for purposes of trying to understand the ecosystem and how it's functioning. All right, thank you. Next uh, speaker, please. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Emil. I'm from the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Um, so this is not um, a forum where I spend a lot of time, at least in the past, but I'm, I'm very excited to be part of these conversations because we are looking into uh, particularly human rights uh, impact assessment methodologies to uh, what we are currently calling digital business activities, which is a term that uh, you can disagree with. But but anyway, but I just wanted to um, kind of highlight one, one point. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, depending on if anyone wants to take that up. But um, we talk a lot about, we talk about core values um, and, but then, and we, we do mention society, but otherwise we mentioned a lot um, consumers and end users and so on, which I think is a little bit of a flawed term because there might be many people impacted by a certain IoT device that is not a user or a consumer. And I think terminology sometimes really matters and I think it makes sense when we discuss core internet values to actually think about just humans or whatever word you want to use and not fall into the trap of thinking about it in the sense that um, I think particularly the private sector has wanted to deal with these issues, that everyone is a user and a, and a consumer, uh, which is a very positive framing for someone who's potentially impacted without even having had a, any choice in that process. So I'll leave that comment right there and uh, hope that someone of you take that up. <laughs> uh, thank you for this, uh, Hisham. Uh, thank you, Olivier. Uh, my name is uh, Hisham Abul Yazid. I'm uh, speaking in this context for uh, my own thing. Uh, so I, I, I just wanted to link this to what core values actually are, and among them, in my mind, is universality, uh, safety and security, the do no harm principle, um, and also being um, inter um, the, the internet being development oriented as well. And the, f for some part. Of, of this world and this big network of networks, we are still missing in the discussion a few of the perspectives from the global south. And we, we tend to think that most of the IoT deployments maybe will come first in uh, well-developed countries, but we still the impact that will come from small networks and few devices in the global south will do or have the potential to do as much harm to the big network and to the core of the internet as well. And I hope that part of the discussion is, is not missing as we move forward. And very quickly also I want to move to some part of the discussion that um, uh, went on the table um, about the balance between the permissionless innovation and what could be done to ensure some principles of responsibility, I would say. And I, 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 think, and I, I think in this context we need to see the full spectrum of what could be done. It's not just as, um, as if we can even uh, either have no, no thing at all, no standardization, no classification, no legislation, or we are just jumping into talking about legislations and treaties. And there, I, I think there are plenty of solutions in this spectrum that we, sh we should look more seriously into. Um, this balance, I think, between different solutions is, is key to how we deal with this. Um, and I, I, I want just before uh, closing this comment to, to go back to the principle of the information society and the internet being development oriented. Um, for the developing world to make use of the IoT applications and devices and what have you for the purpose of SDGs, it will take them for the institutions of those countries, for the governments, for the other actors in these countries, to be able to test those deployments. And without us giving it a good thought, I don't think we will help these countries actually achieve what they could achieve out of deploying IoT in the right way. When we think about solutions, I think we still need to look at capabilities and institutional solutions that can work across the, the globe. And um, so some of the solutions maybe we are still discussing today they still would give some fragmentation of a mass market that can happen. Thank you, and I apologize if I went too long. No, thank you very much for this, Hisham. You, you mentioned that, of course, you know, the global south and, and of course, markets which I, I guess have more price pressures than the, the markets in, let's say, Western Europe. 
we've had a discussion here about the potential for more uh, government intervention or, or, or testing of devices, etc. How do you see this affecting the, the, the global south? Because it, everything has a cost. Well, at, at the moment, I, I feel that there's still not enough incentive for the producers, maybe, and the manufacturers to still take an extra investment to do some verification on their side. So it's left up to the users, sometimes up to the markets, to decide for themselves. And we are asking too much of the user at, at this level. I think an average user would, in an IoT environment, and the many around the table would know more about this, would at least have like 50 devices to deal with on a daily basis or weekly basis, I don't know. So if, if you're asking me to keep track and be informed on 50 devices from different manufacturers, this is impossible to, for me to do. So what, what most people would do, and this would make very much sense in, in context of the survey made here in Germany, uh, my colleague here to the right mentioned, uh, the, the customers would look in any, in any country, whether global south or global north, would still look for someone to help them with this. Sometimes it would be uh, user associations in, uh, in some context, if they are strong enough and uh, well resourced, but in other countries it will be government institutions, and even in those governments are still not equipped with the frameworks to do this. So we, we still need to explore solutions around that, I think. Right, thank you. We're, we're hearing quite a variety of views on, on, on this from stronger influence by governments, less influence by governments, stronger uh, informing of users and, and uh, yeah, let's, let's continue this. Let's have uh, Jim Sunil for you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, we do generally accept that there is need for light regulation because if you do not have control for anything whatsoever, then that thing will self-destruct. So there has to be some light control regulation at the national level, regional level, and global. So there is no doubt about the level, the previous two levels, the national and regional. But at the global level, uh, you know, my friend Alexandro talked about uh, the outcome of uh, the CSTD uh, working group report was thrown out. Well, let's face it, one of the, uh, the, one of the two out outcomes, or we can say even the two major outcomes of the WISIS 2005 have been very, very uh, impactful to global peace. Look at the IGF. It is as a result of UN mechanism, right? And business is happy with it. We are happy with it. Now, the second line is enhanced cooperation. Now, one way or the other, the basic reason for that enhanced cooperation has been satisfied, which has to do with the critical information infrastructure. Now we're talking about bigger issues in terms of uh, how to keep the space safe, okay, that actors should uh, imbibe, uh, if we can say, civilized norms and things like that. Or there may be need, there should be a treaty or what have you. Well, it's going to be challenging to get to a treaty level, but nothing stops us. That is my point. From using that same framework, you know, that's uh, deliver this internet governance, uh, and also is uh, is there for a solution to be arrived at. I was a member of the uh, CSTD working group on the Ask cooperation on the international on the internet public policy matters. And uh, all stakeholders were in there, the working group, and the discussion was frank. At the first part, that is the first phase of the working group, it was really rancorous because there wasn't the clear understanding. But at the second working group, it, there was more understanding of the issues. And you know, all these notes we are even discussing, we've discussed all of them, and uh, I, I could say here, it was just uh, maybe one, 0.1% opposition to what has been generally accepted by every other member of the committee, of the working group. Just 0.1% of uh, member that uh, had objected, and that crashed the whole uh, resolution. So all this norm that uh, the high-level panel came up with, they had been more cooperation at the top level, 
Yes, it's been evaluated. We even did a mapping that justified this has been happening. And then the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace, she said there has to be a multi-stakeholder, a standing multi-stakeholder engagement mechanism. But that was the last one, the last recommendation that includes all. So we already have a framework. So that's the point that is already there within the framework that brought out this idea. It's already there. We don't need to reinvent any other thing. Why business say we don't want to go to ITU is because we don't have opportunity to have one uh, to, to, for our voice to stand as like a voice of a state actor. You know, in the ITU, there is restriction in terms of uh, influence for treaty, uh, the crafting and resolution or ratification of treaty. But with regard to the working group, there is equal participation, participation at equal level, equal footing. So I think we still need to look at that. This is my uh, objective evaluation. What we came up with from that phase two of enhanced cooperation is exactly what the thing that uh, uh, the Global Commission on Stability Cyberspace and the high level panel, that is exactly the same thing we came up with. So, but the CSTD is already an existing framework that we could use. Thank you. Thank you, Jimson. Next, we have Matthew Shears. So I wanted to come back to a couple of the comments that were made because I think you made some excellent comments. And um, I want to start with Halid's point that um, we have billions of devices coming onto the market. We don't have the luxury of time to point the finger at different stakeholders. I mean, this, is, this really is going to have to be a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, and, and it, doesn't it doesn't in any way, it doesn't necessarily in any way undermine permissionless innovation. I mean, you have a whole layer of players that need to engage here. And in the earlier session, we talked about the importance of, for example, labeling IoT devices that go into the retail space. We talked about certification. When you think about CE marking that was introduced, I can't remember how many years ago now, but at that time, that was a, a basic marking to ensure health and safety requirements were met. At the time, manufacturers weren't overly pleased by that because it required additional processes to go through. But at the end of the day, it actually did help um, even in the minds of consumers, for them to be able to identify what kind of products were actually certified and which had a role on the market. So there are, I think it's, this, is, this is for all players, from the user. We can't say that this is user-centric internet if we, don't if we don't assume, as a user, some certain level of responsibility. But it's all layers. User, certification entities, consumer groups, through to governments, and I, but I don't think we have the luxury of time to sit around and debate the merits of one or the other. I think it's going to be very much have to be a, a, an approach that we take on together. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Matthew. The gentleman over there, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Yoshihiro Obata from Japan. Uh, I have an observation here that, um, that uh, what we are discussing here is uh, um, pretty similar to what we are uh, starting to see in Japan because of global warming. So what we are seeing in Japan right now is because of the change in, you know, uh, in the atmosphere, we are seeing a lot of disasters, much more than before. And we used to have a lot of ideas, especially on a national level, to prevent uh, disasters. So dis disaster prevention was one of the major uh, issues for the country. But now I think we are throwing away the idea of uh, disaster prevention anymore because what we are seeing and starting to see is way too, much, too, too big that there's no time, no money and no people to, to really design something or even build something to prevent anymore. So we're now moving towards what we call uh, disaster mitigation. So we start to see that, okay, if some big thing comes in, okay, let's forget this part. And unfortunately, in the uh, current storm, we lost a small number of people. But if we try to prevent that, that was nearly impossible in a, from the financial point of view and also from the time point of view. So what we see here is the explosion of devices and also explosion of connectivity. Uh, and then uh, the permissionless innovation, which is kind of explosion of technology. And there's no way that we can prevent problems. It's, it's impossible. Of course, in the past, it was possible because 
the economy was not growing so fast, the technology was not changing so fast. So like these uh, classification, like these mechanisms, uh, certification, they I think mostly worked. But I think we are now at the stage where we need to start try, trying to mitigate the troubles and then introduce old mechanisms like certification or whatever that we can mitigate the, the challenges or the problems to, to make it under our uh, control and then uh, to, how do you say, to, to enjoy the benefit of these old devices and technologies and whatever. Thank you. Thank you for these suggestions. Let's have, uh, is it two, two hands? Okay, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, it's the two-finger hand, which apparently is very important. I will have a reply important. to Jameson and several other of the interventions in the program speech. Okay, fine. Uh, let's go over to Vincef, because I know that you have to leave very soon. So I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, the certification idea, uh, I think, has a lot of um, value to it. Although the question of how you test, sorry. Oh, I'm the, speaking to the, people behind you. Uh, oh, uh, thank you. Okay. Um, I was trying to figure out what the signal meant. Uh, the question of what tests you do in order to certify something is quite tricky, especially if a lot of it is software, uh, trying to be assured or reassured that the software is good. One area of uh, importance there would be open sources and open, you know, the libraries, GitHub and things like that. There's a big issue there because you put all this software in, make it available, everybody thinks because it's open source, all the bugs will have been found, and the answer is nobody looked because they thought somebody else did. So we have to be really thoughtful about how to do the certification, but it brings me to the second point, which has to do with informed responsibility. It's hard to take responsibility for something if you aren't adequately informed. And so we owe it to those who must make decisions, whether it's consumers or manufacturers or legislators, that they have the information they need in order to make sensible decisions. So I'll have to run away, Mr. Chairman, but thank you so much for allowing me to participate. This is an important topic. Thank you very much for joining us. So, Khaled Fatal, briefly, please, and then I want to give the floor to somebody who hasn't spoken yet. I'll be very brief. In fact, I am glad that some of my friends here uh, did pick up the gauntlet and uh, responded. Um, I've got a couple of comments. There are certain elements in the core values that have been, and I'm, I'm glad that they responded, certain elements in what is known, uh, what has been described in the presentation as core values that can be treated as axioms. Others that cannot, that are not axioms, with all due respect. And let's just be, let's, let's just be clear here. As, for example, openness. We have the a gentleman here who helped structure the, uh, the infrastructure of the internet. Openness is at the core. It's a core value. So that's an axiom, which means we don't need to debate this. But when we start talking about uh, permissionless, please define that. You want to tell me that's a core value? Let's, let's have another debate on this. We didn't have to ask you for permission. That's, Precisely. That's what that means. Okay. Precisely. Well, you see, the point is we have to define it to those who are not sitting listening to us talking about multi-stakeholderism. Because the truth of the matter here is, uh, if we want to win the debate for those who are not in this parish, the multi-stakeholder parish that we all belong to, we cannot, we cannot lecture it to them from a Puritan point of view. So, and the point to, you responded to what I was saying earlier on is absolutely valid, but I was very conscientious in your statement, never once did you mention that legislation by governments is also one of those actions. And if we don't make that as part of the spectrum of what is actionable, then we're missing the boat of how the speed is so dangerous, the speed of this deployment is so dangerous to society. And last but not least, certification. Voluntary certification or, or regulated certification? See, these are part of the issues of how we make ourselves relevant. When governments ask us what do we do, especially those who are not subscribers to the multi-stakeholder model, which if I remember, is still an experiment and what I would call is still in beta. So it's still in beta. Let's make it work well so people will adopt it. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled. Let's have one more intervention from the floor from the gentleman at the back. And then we'll go over to the 6F uh, framework that Alejandro Pizanti will speak to us about.
thank you thank you very much chair for the record this is mohammad shabir rawan from pakistan and i am the president of internet society accessibility special interest group and also i am a member of uh, uh, dynamic coalition on accessibility and disability uh, i would like to highlight here or draw the attention of the house towards uh, while we are discussing the core values of the internet uh, stability, security, resilience, all that is very good stuff and openness too, uh, while uh, we have talked about a lot about uh, this in this session. Uh, but accessibility on the internet is the core value and I would like to draw attention towards the uh, population which is like uh, about different statistics. It, it, it varies from 10 to 15 percent about person with disabilities. So while we are discussing the core values, uh, Internet may be reachable to them, device may be in their hands, but it is still possible that they may not be able to use that device as effectively as uh, it were in, in someone else's hand. So we need to make it, uh, make it somewhat uh, possible that uh, the devices, uh, be it IoT or internet or the computers or softwares or hardwares, uh, to follow a universal design so that everyone, everyone can use those devices. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very key uh, point, actually. I've, I've heard it repeated in other uh, fora, but it's uh, particularly important, especially for IoT devices, now that they are about to permeate so many parts of our society, so the software of these devices, etc. We need to go to uh, Alejandro Pisanti for the 6F framework that he's going to present to us because that links in with the discussions we've had so far. So let's have the presentation, please. And Alejandro, you have the floor. So, um, uh, Good afternoon, uh, or whatever time it is for other remote speaker uh, attendants. Uh, thank you, Olivia, for uh, giving me the floor. Thanks, uh, Martin Botterman and others for their support in bringing this to presentation. Uh, what I'm going to present you is a framework I'm proposing and putting forward for, so that you can challenge it. It's maybe not complete or not relevant enough, and it will be by this interaction that will be made better. Uh, the, uh, it, it is meant to help us analyze things we see on the internet or cyberspace in terms of things we know. This doesn't mean that there's nothing new under the sun. Lots of things change when we go to cyberspace. But when we look at several different types of conduct, from the positive, or the likable ones like sharing, to the ones like uh, crime online, we often find that the people who are performing it, or the, human, the agents of human beings, like even software, uh, are actually performing an action or are acting on a motivation that we already know. So we hear people uh, say lots of things like well, they will never uh, stop liking the smell of paper, but they will want the PDF immediately. Uh, we hear about the originality of cybercrime and so forth. So we build from uh, the internet design principles and goals, and here, Hallett, we have a clear description. Uh, there's a difference with what you saw on screen from Siva, Sabrio, Mani, and Mutusami, because he has put in a set of non-core internet values into the list, which are uh, societal values that are not design principles of the internet, and that's, that's, where, that's where we depart. Uh, so these are the ordered hierarchically principles from which you arrive at permissionless innovation. To your question, permissionless innovation is not a vague phrase. It's a very precise term uh, that we attend to. It means you don't have to ask permission to the internet for doing something. There's no director, there's no manager of the internet, there's no broadcaster or telecommunications company who tells you whether you can put in a video link. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're acting without any permissions or without any rule of law. Everything that's done on the internet is done by someone somewhere. And this person may be violating the country's constitution, may be violating his state's or city's regulations, he may be even uh, violating his condominium arrangements by, by doing things. Uh, uh, so th this is not permissionless in that sense. This is not a far west. This is not a, a, a space without law, or as uh, governments like to say, a non-governed space. I go quickly here to the framework. The purpose of the framework is to understand when we can conduct that we see online from offline or to map it vice versa. Uh, the method we use here very often is when people are mired in discussions, is we ask them to remove the internet from the problem. Let's say people are discussing phishing and we tell them, you know, phishing 
Uh, we have seen phishing, we have seen people stripped of their credentials for access to their money in physical spaces. Just two weeks ago, a, a woman in Mexico was, I mean, I know her because her son works in the same place as I do. He tells me she was a victim of the following attack. A person came to her office, a guy came to her office or home with a piece of paper in a clipboard that had the logotypes of several banks and that told her, you are working for the security of the banks and we need to renew the credentials of people. So she signed off, and this is exactly the same operation as you see in phishing, but it was done by hand, and she actually hand signed with a pen and ink. The same thing that you would do on phishing. So what is the difference between doing that face-to-face uh, -face and doing that on the internet? Number one, the thing that changes is that you have mass scaling. You have network effects added, but you, mostly you have uh, mass effect. So this person could only, this, this criminal could only address maybe 50 women, 50 persons, 50 older people during the day, whereas on the internet he can address 50 million with a single click. Uh, second is the identity and anonymity management of the internet. This person has to come up to the office, he has to come through a place where there is maybe a, a camera for video surveillance. Uh, he's sort of showing identity, which is much easier to hide on the internet because the internet has no intrinsic architectural requirement, you saw in the requirements there's no uh, requirement, in the principles there's no requirement for identification and authentication. This anonymity and all these factors may be either for good or for bad. We know that anonymity is good for uh, political activism. We know that anonymity is good, as a Lebanese engineer said in a, in a previous internet governance forum session on core values, she needs anonymity on the net because if women in her place uh, look at their own bodies and ask questions about the reproductive or uh, physiological behavior, their brothers may find they, have, they are having impure thoughts by thinking about their bodies and may actually stone them to death. And I don't mean any particular religion, I mean this can happen in countries in my, in counties, in small towns in my country of Mexico. So anonymity can play this positive effect. Next thing you see is transjurisdictional effects. You see this with the example of fishing again. Fishing works very well because there's crosses, it crosses country boundaries. So the victim is in one country, the criminal is another, and maybe the funds transfers take place to a bank in the third country. And of course, domain name registration, website hosting, and so forth go across borders. So at least this makes it very difficult to attribute the attack. And even if you can actually be sure who is a criminal, you have police intelligence, you will not be able to act through the law because there's too many countries which will not contribute to your prosecution. They will not give you the evidence of what the IP address was used, who, was, who it was handed to, and so forth. Then you have higher level effects in order. One is barrier lowering. You have a lowering of the barrier to access to the market, of the economic access to the market. You have a lowered barrier to form a grouping. So you can have Wikipedia organized without having the big established company of the Encyclopedia Britannica. You can have a criminal gang formed. You can form uh, e-commerce. Uh, all this has a much lower barrier than in physical space. You have friction reduction. This is a reduction of the number of operations or energy spent in doing something. That leads you to one-click shopping in electronic commerce stores like e commerce stores like Amazon or travel agencies. It also makes the work of criminals easy in the case of phishing. Again, uh, you, you, you see this red thing that says change your credentials immediately because you're going to lose your money forever and you actually click on it instead of asking, you know, introducing some friction here would be good because you, it, it would give you some time to think before before you actually uh, relinquish your funds. And finally, a set of complex effort, uh, effects comes with memory and forgetting. Wikipedia is a, an excellent example of how we easily increase memory for humankind. Uh, we are actually creating a store of knowledge that's distributed and so forth, so it's much more robust. Uh, with uh, phishing, for, uh, again, or crime, uh, they actually use the storage of information in order to obtain data that can help committing crimes. So this is mostly what the framework is about. Example, as I mentioned, Wikipedia. You can briefly see how every one of these factors makes Wikipedia better than an encyclopedia. Scales massively with both readers and authors. You can anonymously post things that politically are forbidden. You need to do some management of identity on Wikipedia now because there's some trolling there, but it's like a second order effect. Uh, it works transjurisdictionally, it works all across all borders. So if it's forbidden to you in one country to write or read about something, it is made somewhere else so no one will go to jail, and so forth with these factors. So I would like to submit this to your uh, attention and comments. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Alejandro, and, and thank you for being uh, quick on this. There's actually a question online already, so we'll start with a question online on this topic, and then we'll, of course, have uh, any questions from the floor. All right, it's again Mr. Uh, Shiva Subramanian, and his question is, the internet is global, open, free, user-centric, distributed, end-to-end, -end, interoperable, robust and reliable, and ecosystem of permissionless innovation. Of these values, which one, uh, ones do you refer to as non-core value? Alejandro? That requires an exp an, a, a more extensive reply, and I will do that on right. Okay, uh, next question, Martin Bottomen, and then Jamin further. Well, just being aware of the, 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 that the time is gone, but I'm very happy that you were able to and willing to sketch here those six, six points, uh, Alejandro. I think this is the beginning of much more discussion. I think you get it exactly right. These are su subjects you cannot answer from a single country or a single sector pr perspective. It requires reflection and it touches upon the core. So very looking forward very much to progress that with you. Thank you. Oh, you, I thought you wanted the floor. No, okay. Anyone else on this? I think that's, that really um, uh, ties in with the, uh, with, you know, we've got another few minutes remaining to this session, but it's, it's a good thing to, to work on as maybe one of the next steps, um, certainly the framework that you're, you're uh, proposing here. Alejandro, you might have a few things to add. So we, uh, as long as we have a, a minute or two left, uh, I, I would like to address in particular James on uh, concerns with this framework. As you can see, if we, if we address CSTD, if we think CSTD will work on, will do some work on IoT, we can ask whether it will perform any well uh, in front of any of these six factors. Uh, it will particularly not scale well because it's a country by country and a single agreement. And it will be very slow to get a treaty. And then the effectiveness of the treaty doesn't scale with the internet. Uh, it, uh, again, I mean, it, it, it's nice uh, from a cross-jurisdictional point of view but it still assumes too much about identity management, for example, which doesn't work. I mean, if you have a CSTD agreement on IoT, it will assume that you can trace people uh, who are producing software, who are producing hardware, or who are using it, or who are abusing it. And it will crash against the identification factor, and so forth. So, it, it, I mean, if, if you want something that formally says that the proposal of having the, the CSTD govern IoT by treaty, uh, if you want a, uh, a way to destroy, let's say, not to destroy that, but to prove that it won't work, you have these six factors and it doesn't work with almost any of them. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Next is Peter Major. Uh, uh, thank you, Alejandro. <coughs> well, let me put it clearly. CSTD doesn't uh, create treaties, doesn't uh, give any formal binding uh, conventions. Uh, what we have been talking about was a multi-stakeholder working group on equal footing giving recommendations. And one of the reasons we are here was one of the working groups we have been working with that is the improvement to the RGF. And it has been mentioned in the UNGA <coughs> resolution that the extension of the mandate of the RGF was partially based on that. So that's why we are, we are here and we can discuss things. Now, what I heard from Jimson was a proposal to, to bring in to a neutral body all the ideas in a multi-stakeholder environment and come up with some recommendations. And basically that's what CSTD can do and prove to be able to do. So I think this is one of the good ways forward and probably you may agree on that. Uh, what I heard in Jimson's presentation was repeatedly the word treaties and, uh, and, and the governing structure, and, that, and that, that's the one I'm addressing. A forum I'm not, I have no problem with. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, actually, uh, that is it, you know, a, a forum where you could discuss those issues. And then, uh, now listen, see, where it is, where that comes in is this. It's mentioned that the 
working group on improvement to IGF. See the recommendation of the working group on improvement to IGF passed through even the CSTD structure to the UNGA, and that led to the extension of the Internet Governance Forum, where we are sitting here today. So the recommendation of that group, working group, can, once everybody agrees, because the uh, private sector is there, civil society, you know, the academia, on equal footing, our recommendation then goes into that st structure. Since we already agree, it's whatever we agree that is passed down. That is how it works. If we do not agree, it's not going anywhere. But I just told you, the first part, we had, we had about 50% disagree on two sides about what to do. The second uh, phase, it was just less than 0.1%, okay? So we, we, there's an improvement, but that's an existing structure, a framework that has worked before that we can use. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jameson. And I have a red light that has been flashing at me for nearly two minutes, which means we're actually out of time. Um, I'm a bit scared of red lights. Shane, any uh, last closing words from uh, your side? Uh, just to thank you for putting the whole IoT discussion at a different light. So I think it really was a, an elegant way to have a, a longer discussion about both issues and, and put it in a good perspective. So I, I really appreciate your time towards this. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of our panelists and everyone who has uh, contributed today. And I hope that you can continue the work by joining both coalitions, the DCIoT and the DC on Core Internet Values. Thank you so much, and have a very good uh, morning, afternoon, evening, or night, wherever you are, but lunch probably over here in Berlin. Thank you. <laughs>